Okay, my message title for today is Three Kings, Samuel the Last Judge. We've just finished a sermon series on Ephesians, and I thought I'd just jump into this one. This I've been working on this for a long, long time, and finally I want to uh, get it uh, off of my chest, if I could say it like that. So what we're doing is a sermon series on the three kings. This is not a Christmas message. This is not about that song you know well, we three kings. It's not that one, all right? This is about the first three kings of Israel. More importantly, it's the first three kings and the only three kings to actually reign over a united Israel. And those three kings is Saul, David, and Solomon. This is a four-part series. Today's one is going to be the build up to the time of the kings. All right, so we're starting with the last judge, Samuel. So his story starts with his mom, as most of our stories do. His mom's name was Hannah. Hannah was married to a guy called Elkanah. And Elkanah also had another wife, Penina. Most, in the Old Testament, most guys had two or three wives. And that was for very obvious reasons. If your first wife upset you and had a fight with you, you just go to your second wife. And if she fights with you, you go fishing. That's why there's so many fishermen in the Bible. <laughs> no, there were other reasons for it. <laughs> but that's my reason anyway. I think it works. So now, Penina could have children. But Hannah couldn't. She was barren. She couldn't conceive. So they went to the tabernacle, as would be the normal. Um, there were three feasts that everyone had to go to. So they were at the tabernacle at Shiloh one time. And she falls before God and she prays to God and says, God, please bless me and favor me so I can have children. And he does. He blesses her. She goes home, conceives, and she has a baby bouncing boy. And that boy's name is Samuel. So let's open up our Bibles as we read that story together. This is from the book of Samuel. The series is on the three kings. It takes place in the books of Samuel and Kings, even a bit of Chronicles. So it's a lot of history recovering, and this is kind of where this will be going to. So our first reading is from the book of Samuel, chapter 3. It says this, The Lord came and stood there calling, as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. And the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears them tingle. At that time, I will carry out against Eli everything I spoke against his family. Eli at the time was the chief priest, like acting as the high priest in the tabernacle. Everything I spoke against his family from beginning to end. For I told him that I would judge his family forever because of the sin he knew about. His sons blasphemed God. Eli was not necessarily that bad, but he couldn't control his wicked, dodgy, sketchy sons, Hophni and Phinehas. And because of that, God would judge the whole family. I told you that I would judge his family because of the sin he knew about. His sons blasphemed God, and he failed to restrain, restrain them. Therefore, I swore to the house of Eli, the guilt of Eli's house will never be atoned for by sacrifice or by offering. So the first part of the story that we're going to talk about is about Eli. Eli and his two sons. At this time, Samuel is still a very young boy. The story is that Hannah promised God that if he gave her a son, she would dedicate her child to the, to the tabernacle, to the priesthood. And that's what she'd done. So when Samuel was a little boy, she took him to the tabernacle and handed him over to the priest under the tutorship and the leadership and mentorship of Eli, the chief priest. So he, Samuel at this time was still a young boy. Eli was a very old man. And one day God speaks to Samuel, and they're sleeping in the tabernacle in the tents, and all of a sudden this voice booms and says, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel, the little boy, jumps up and he goes to Eli, thinking that Eli has called him. And Eli says, no, just go back to bed. You must be dreaming. So he goes back, and again this voice booms out, Samuel. Samuel. And again he goes to Eli a second time and says, Eli, are you calling me or what? Eli knows that this is probably then the voice of God. And he says, listen, go back to bed. When the voice says Samuel, Samuel again, say, your servant is listening. So Samuel goes back to bed and he's sleeping. All of a sudden he hears the voice, Samuel, Samuel. And he gets up and he says, speak, your servant is listening. And God gives Samuel a word for Eli. He doesn't go directly to Eli. He gives it to this young boy, Samuel. And he says, I'm going to give you this word that you must go take to Eli. It's a word of judgment against him and his family. So the next morning, young Samuel gets up very bold and courageous. And he goes to his teacher, his mentor, Eli. And he says, God's told me that he's going to bring judgment against you 
and your family, and they're all going to be wiped out. No sacrifice or gifts can atone for your sins. And that's actually what happens. And the reason for that is because of Eli's two sons. Their names is Hophni and Phinehas. They were really dodgy, sketchy guys, really wicked. They were supposed to be the leaders of Israel, and they were doing everything wrong. They were making mistake after mistake. So that's our first point today, the mistakes they made. And we're going to carry on reading from Samuel. Now we're just going to jump back to chapter 2. It says this, Eli's sons were scoundrels, basically dodgy. All right, They had no regard for the Lord. Now it was a practice of the priest that uh, whenever any of the people offered a sacrifice, a priest's servant would come with a three-pound fork in his hand while the meat was being boiled, and he would plunge the fork into the pan, the kettle, cold in the pot. Whatever the fork brought out, the priest would take for himself. This is how they treated all the Israelites who came to Shiloh. Shiloh is where the tabernacle was set up. But even before the fat was burned, the priest's servant would come and say to the person who was uh, offering the sacrifice, give the priest some of the meat to roast. He won't accept it, boiled meat from you, but only raw. So there was a special offering called the meat offering. And what you would do, you would come with your family, you would bring meat, and you would give it to the temple, to the tabernacle, to the priest. They will put it in this big cauldron or big pot, and they will boil it away. And then what happens is one of the servants of the priest would come with a long fork, you would plunge it into the thing, and you would pull out. Whatever he pulls out would be for the priest. That was like their payment, if you can look at it like that. And after a while, obviously all the meat would fall off the bone and all. And there won't be much in the pot left. So you might be lucky to get a little piece of meat or maybe a piece of fat. And these two priests were not happy with that. They wanted a bigger stick of the meat, a bigger stick flace. All right. So they said, no, we're not happy with that. So what they'd done was they sent their servant to the, the guys coming into the tabernacle before they even gave their meat to get boiled. They stopped them at the gate and said, listen, the, the priest wants a, a big chunk of your meat. Just cut that portion off right there. He wants it boy. They, they don't even bother about boiling it or cooking it. They were the original mafia. You think the Italians were mafias? No. The Jews, they took the cake when they came to be mafia hosts. Can you believe they would do that? Extortion, bribery, all the, even prostitution. It really sounds like the mafia now that I'm thinking of it. They actually accepted the prostitutes in the game. They extorted people for their meat and, and they done. And you know what they were doing by doing that? They weren't doing it uh, out of any other reason than robbing God. That meat belonged to God. The people would bring it and give all their offering. It wasn't for anybody else. They would boil it up. They were saying, this meat is for you, Lord. It's yours. And they were taking a big chunk of that for themselves. So what were they doing? They were robbing God. And you know, let me just be honest. If you want to rob God, you're robbing the wrong person. Or I don't care if you're in a mafia or not. When you start robbing God, you're messing with the wrong dude. That was their first mistake. The second mistake was they were in a battle with the Philistines. The Philistines were always a thorn in Israel's side, always fighting for many, many centuries. What happens, they were fighting and the Jews were losing the battle. So they decided, let's get a new brilliant plan together. This is what we're going to do. We're going to bring the Ark of the Covenant onto the battlefield. Now put up your hand if you've heard of that word, Ark of the Covenant. Or have you ever seen it before? Let me show you, Alex. <laughs> there, that's the Ark of the Covenant. It's a very big box. I've actually had one made for me, so it's about a meter, and it's about 750. It's gold-plated, and inside it's empty. Inside that Ark of the Covenant, they would have the tablets of Moses, the Ten Commandments. And on top of that Ark was a lid, and as you can see, beautiful angels with their wings touching each other. This was the most sacred object in all of Judaism. Actually, probably, in fact, of all religions ever. This would be the most sacred object. It was found in the Holy of Holies, the most sacred, holiest place in the tabernacle. This is where God would come and meet his people. This is where the high priest once a year would come and offer the sacrifice, the blood sacrifice for the sins of the people. So this was very, very sacred, very, very holy. Even if you touched it, you would die. And someone said, hey, let's bring this thing out onto the battlefield. And who were the leaders of that? The sons of Eli, Hophni and Phineas. So they said, that's a great idea. Let's do that. Let's take the sacred object and let's go bring it into the battlefield. So they'd done that. They brought it onto the battlefield and it caused a lot of commotion, both for the Jews and for the Philistines, because that was a mistake. And that mistake would bring consequences. Bad, bad consequences. Let's look at our second point. It's called the misery they face. So let's read about a couple of those consequences for their mistakes. This is in chapter 4. It says, When the ark of the Lord's covenant 
came into the camp. All Israel raised such a great shout that the ground shook. So they were all very happy now that the ark was there. God would defend them and protect them. Maybe lasers would shoot out from the ark and destroy the Philistines. I don't know what they thought that was going to do. Here in the uproar, the Philistines asked, what's all the shouting in the Hebrew camp? When they learned that the ark of the Lord had come to the camp, the Philistines were afraid. A God has come into the camp, they said. Oh no, nothing like this has happened before. We're doomed. Who will deliver us from the hand of these mighty gods? They believed that the, um, the Jews actually believed in many gods, like everyone else did at the time. He says, um, they, are not the, they are the gods. They struck down the Egyptians with all kinds of plagues in the wilderness. So they knew about what happened in Egypt. Be strong, Philistines. One guy cried out, be strong, Philistines. Be men, or you'll be subject to the Hebrews as they have been to you. Be men and fight. So the Philistines fought and the Israelites were defeated and every man fled to his tent. The slaughter was so very great, Israel lost 30,000 foot soldiers. Talk about consequences for their bad mistakes. The ark of, the God, the ark of God was captured by the Philistines and Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, died. So let's first not point too many fingers. Uh, put up your hand if you're perfect. Seems that I'm the only one who's perfect here today. <laughs> no one's perfect. We all make mistakes. Orphan and Phineas, yeah, sure. Not maybe the mistakes that we'd have done, but we're not perfect and we're all guilty of some mistakes. Even maybe before you became a Christian, maybe there's something in your life before you were saved that you'd done a bad mistake, a bad decision, and you're still dealing with those consequences today. Maybe even as a Christian, you have made some mistakes and you're not happy about it. And those mistakes led to bad consequences and led to misery. I think we've all been at some stage in our life. If you're going to do something bad, especially against God, then there will be consequences to pay. And this is what happened. As you can read in that story, what happened was they brought the, the Ark of the Covenant into the battle. The Philistines thought, this is over. The, the gods are going to pop out of this thing and kill us all. And then one guy stood up in the Philistine camp, and, he, and, and I love this motivational speech by this guy. He basically said this, stop crying like babies, be men, and fight like men. That's all he said. You've heard it there. So they did. They started to fight, and they killed all of the Jews. 30,000 people of them died. Not only that, the ark was captured, and the sons of Eli died too. So now word gets back to Eli. Eli at this time was 98 years old. 98 years old. He was sitting at the tabernacle just waiting for news from the battlefield. They come back to Eli and they say, Eli, Eli, we've got bad, very bad news. Israel has lost the fight. 30,000 soldiers are dying. Eli says, you know, well, they, they probably deserve it. They weren't the greatest army anyway. He wasn't too surprised by that. Then they come and say, oh, yeah, Eli and your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, they died in the battle also. He says, you know, I'm not surprised by that because God told me that was going to happen. They were up to no good. They deserved what they got. Then they say, but Eli, do you know that the ark of God was captured? And that does surprise him. You know what the Bible says? It says, first of all, he was old and a little bit overweight. All right? The Bible actually says that he was old and heavy. I don't know what heavy means in the Bible, but I just picture he was a big set man. It says when the news came to him about the ark, it says that this old 98-year-old heavy man fell backwards, broke his neck, and died. Now I'm telling you, we all watch Netflix. This should be a Netflix original series because this would this would be better than Game of Thrones. I'm telling you, the story is so layered with so many intricacies to it. He dies. Can you believe it? So now he's dead. He's the spiritual leader of Israel. His two sons are dead. There's nobody leading the Israelites. Thirty thousand people are dead, and the ark has been captured. Now news gets to his daughter-in-law. He, she was married to Phineas. He's just died in battle. She's also pregnant. So this is season two of our Netflix original called Sam, Samuel. Let's call it Samuel, all right? The last judge. So season two starts and the news gets to Phineas's wife. She's with child and they come and tell her, oh, no, you won't believe what happened. Israel has lost the war. She goes, ah. Oh. And then they say, oh, yeah, and your husband, he's dead in battle. And she goes, ah. Oh just like a drama queen as she would be. And then they say, oh, yeah, and the Ark of the Covenant was captured by the Philistines. And she goes, ah. And then they say, oh, yeah, and your father-in-law, Eli, he's dead. And with that news, she actually goes into premature labor. She starts giving birth prematurely. And the sad part about it is she actually dies while giving childbirth. As the baby comes out, she dies, but she manages to name the child. 
She names the child Ichabod. Ichabod. Can you say that with me quick? Ichabod. Ichabod means the glory has departed. It literally means no glory. That's what the word means. It comes from two Hebrew words. I, I, and kabod. Kabod is glory and E is no. No glory. And in the context she was saying, it's over. We've lost the war. There's no soldiers left. The ark is gone. The priests are gone. Eli, the leader, he's gone. It's all over. God has finally left. He's left Israel to their own devices. He's never going to come back. His power is gone. His presence is gone. His glory is gone. And you know what? When we make mistakes in life, sometimes we stray from God. It's sometimes what Christians call backslidden Christians. You still are a Christian, but you have no fellowship with God. Your relationship with God is intact. He's still your father. You are still his son or daughter. But your fellowship and communion with God is threatened and broken down. And this is what Ichabod is. It's when as a Christian you're doing bad things, maybe contrary to God's will or word, and you backslide and you fall away either from his word, his will or the church, and in that state the spirit of Ichabod comes upon you and you really feel a sense that God has left you. Have you ever felt like that before? No, well, you must grow up and then you'll find out. I'm sure most of these people have felt that, that, that way at time in your life. When, when you feel like the presence of God has left you, you're crying out and there's no, nothing. And you realize that it's because of my own sin or my own wrongdoing or whatever it is. And you look around and the glory has departed. There's no presence of God no more. There's no power no more. We have a form of godliness, but there's no power. You look around and say, God, where are you? The Ichabod spirit is upon you. Let me tell you what happened to the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant gets captured by who? The Philistines. They take it back to a town called Ashod. This is where they have a temple where their God is. And their God is called Dagon. Dagon. And he's a half man, half fish. If you type D-A-G-O-N, Dagon, on the internet, it'll be like a man. He looks like this. He's got a torso of a man and he's got a... Uh, legs of a fish. It looks like a fish from the bottom. Dagon. So they had him set up in the temple. They bring the Ark of the Covenant and they say, oh look, we've got another God. Let's put that one down next to Dagon. And then they leave. They come back the next day and what they find is that Dagon, their God, has now fallen over. Face down. And they think, well that's odd. It must be the wind coming in. So they close all the doors. They put him back up. The next morning they come in again. You know what happens? Dagon's back down, face down. This time his head is broken off and his hands are broken off. Now that should be a big red flag right there for the Philistines. And that was. They started to get really, really worried, thinking that maybe the ark has done this. All of a sudden, racks break out in the camp, start infecting people. Thousands of people die. Tumors start breaking out on people. Thousands of people are dying in this town. They think we've got to get rid of this ark. So they take the Ark of the Covenant and they give it to the next city in line, which is called Gad or Goth. So they go and say, hey, listen, we got this beautiful gift. Don't you want this beautiful gold box? Yeah, take it, take it, take it. They said, we don't want that thing because they just kill all of your people. You can keep it. They said, no, well, you're going to take it. And they force it upon Goth. So now the people, they all start getting sick and dying. They decide, we're going to keep this Ark of the Covenant. We've got to give it to somebody else. And they do. They go to the next town in line called Ekron. And they do the same thing. Hey, guys, don't you want this beautiful gold box? Take it. Take it. It's for free. You, you can use it. Do it. Do whatever you want. They said, we don't want this because it killed all of your people. They said, we don't care. Take it. So they forced it on the last place, Ekron. And eventually people start dying there. The Philistines don't know what to do. Every time they move this ark, people die. So they decide the only thing they can do is send it back to Israel. And now they do that. It's, a, it's the most ingenious plan I've ever seen in the Bible. They put the ark... The back of a cart, you know, like an ox wagon cart. They put two cows on and they aim these <laughs> cows at Israel. They don't have GPS those days. So they just aim the two cows towards Israel. They stand back and smack it on the bum, and there goes the cows walking towards Israel. And that was how they done it. They didn't know where the cows would land up. As long as those cows didn't do a U turn, they were happy. And there the cows go, and the cows actually make it all the way into Israel. Obviously, God was at his hand in that also. But it goes right into the Israeli territory, and it lands up in a place called kiriath Jerem. And there, somebody sees the ark, and he sees the cows, and he takes the ark. This is a good guy. He takes the ark, and he becomes a custodian of it. And what blows my mind about the story about the ark, this one man takes this ark, and he puts it into his house, like a spare room maybe. And he just puts it in there, and he keeps it. 
for 20 years. This is the most sacred object in the universe. Anybody would love to have it. Yeah, this man takes it and says, I'm responsible for this, him and his children. And he keeps it in his house. And he's blessed by it because he's keeping it and keeping it, uh, taking care of it. God actually blesses him. For 20 years, it's in his house. But this time, Samuel, now remember I told you that we're talking about Eli now. Now Samuel, this little boy, he's grown up. He's a bit more mature. At this point, Eli's dead, so he becomes the high priest of the people. He's not officially the high priest, but he takes the role of the high priest. He's also the last judge. He is now judging the people. The last judge, if you read the Bible, was Samson. Strong man Samson. He dies. Samuel takes over the last position of the last judge. And he's also a prophet because God speaks to him for the people. This is one of the most unique characters in the Bible. He was a prophet, a priest, and a judge. Not many people can say that. And as he grows and matures, he starts calling the people of Israel back to the heart of worship. So let's conclude with our, our last point, which is the miracles they experience. And this is our uh, turns full circle. And finally, the mistakes and consequences lead to God coming back. It says this in 7. Uh, so the men of Kiriath Jerem came and took the ark of the Lord. They brought it to, this is a guy's name. What is his name? Abinadab's. Abinadab's house on the hill and consecrated Elazia, his son, to guard the ark of the Lord. The ark remained at Kiriath Jerem for a long time, 20 years, you know. Then all the people of Israel turned back to the Lord. There is the turning point. Repentance turning back to the Lord. So Samuel said to the Israelites, if you are returning to the Lord with all your hearts, then rid yourselves of the foreign gods and asterisks and commit yourselves to the Lord and serve him only. And he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. So the Israelites put away their bowels and asterisks and served the Lord only. So as I said now, Samuel was now getting a bit older and wiser. He was leading the people, judging them. God was talking to the people and he starts telling them to turn back to God. Not only one on one, but as a nation. Israel, you need to understand that you've done wrong, the mistakes. You've lived with the misery. God has departed. He's out of here. He has left the building, but it's not over yet. You can still experience his presence, his power, the miracles. But you've got to do the job. You've got to turn your hearts back to God. That's what repentance is. Repentance is if you're doing something you're wrong and you turn and say, I'm not going to do that no more. I'm going to follow God. That's what repentance is. But he also says, get rid of all those idols. Baal and Astoreth were two of the gods that they worship in Canaan and Phoenicia. Baal was a male and Astoreth or Ishtar was the female. Like the two lead deities in the place. He said, don't only repent and turn back, but get rid of all these idols. And I think it's a good lesson for us too. When we do wrong, maybe I, I, I say commit sin, but that, that is it. That is contrary to God's will. When we do wrong and commit sin, we should repent of our ways, but not only repent and turn back to God, but get rid of the junk in your life. It's kind of you've got to clean up. You've got to spring clean. You've got to look at all the stuff in your house and say, well, what do I need to get rid of? Is there anything stopping me from fulfilling God's purpose in my life? Is there anything stopping me from growing in Christ? Is there anything stopping me from becoming all that God would want me to be? And you've got to look around at your life. It may not be physical things. It may be spiritual attributes or characteristics that you need to get rid of because it's stopping you from the miracle that's about to happen. And he says to him, repent, get rid of all those things, and God will come back. At that time, they were again in a battle with who? The Philistines. And the Philistines come and they want to conquer. They see now Israel is busy worshipping. They see how things have changed here in Israel. All of a sudden, they're busy worshipping God, Yahweh, at this place in Mizbah. And they decide, well, that's a good opportunity for us to attack. And as they advance in closer to Israel, God shows up. Remember Ichabod? Glory has departed. They repent, turn back to God, and God comes to them. The Bible says, you draw close to God, and he will draw close to you. And I live by those words. And that's what happens. God comes, and he delivers an amazing miracle, probably one of the most unique miracles ever in the Bible. It simply says this. It says, the Lord thundered with a loud thunder. And that was the miracle. That was it. Lightning didn't come down. Angels didn't come down. The earthquake didn't happen. It just says he thundered. So somewhere from the clouds, there was this big, unique, loud, thunderous roar. And it was so bad that the Philistines started to get worried and get disorientated and run all over the place. And the Israelites came 
and conquered them. What happened? God showed up and they experienced the miracle. The beauty of the story ends when now Samuel, as I said, a bit older, a wiser man, he realizes that the glory has returned. God's power, presence, and glory has returned. And he wants to show a memorial to this. He acknowledges that God has come back and helped the people, and he wants to set something up so that people can see that God has done this. So he goes to Mizpah and he sets up the stone, and he gets his big stone together, and he calls it Ebenezer. Ebenezer. It means stone of help. That's exactly what the word means. Eben in Hebrew is stone, and Nazar is help. It literally means a stone of help. And in context, he sets up the stone, the Ebenezer, and he says, this is a memorial, a reminder when God helped us and delivered us from the hand of the Philistines. You know, in our life, we need an Ebenezer because we've been through things. And we know that God has helped us through things. There have been times when you had sicknesses or health issues and God has brought you through. That's your Ebenezer. It's your stone of help and you are reminded of what God done for you. It may be financial or relationship. I don't know what the issues are that you had in your past, but you here today looking back over your history and you know that God has helped you. You know what we need today is an Ebenezer. I actually gave to the church some time ago, probably Bob and Pat and George. You guys will probably still have my Ebenezer stones. What you need to do is go and find the stone of yourself. You can walk around the gardens of the church, go find the stone and write Ebenezer on it. That'll be your personal stone. There's no power in that stone. It's not a talisman. It's not like a good luck charm. But it's a reminder. You put it on your desk or your fireplace or your mantelpiece or on a coffee table at home. And every time you see that stone, you'll be reminded that God has helped you in the past. Not only that, you know that God will help you today. That's the beauty of Ebenezer. It's a stone of help. It shows you that not only has God helped you, but he's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. And the miracles he's done in the past, he will do today. The help that he helped you in the past, he will help you with today. That's what Ebenezer was. That is what Samuel was trying to show the people. You remember the, the plagues of Egypt, how God helped us over there? Remember this, remember that. That's the same God we serve today. Nothing has changed. And we need an Ebenezer in our life. We need to raise up our Ebenezer. We need to hold fast to our Ebenezer, that stone of help, knowing that God has done it for us before, and he will not let you down today. Whatever the trouble is, whatever the burden is, it's a pretty simple message. We may have messed up. We may have made mistakes in life. You turn back to God. You repent. Full circle. You go back to God 180 degrees. And as you draw close to God, he will draw close to you. What you need is an Ebenezer, a reminder of God's faithfulness, his goodness, and his help. No matter what you gain through today, our God is the God of the Ebenezer, the God of help. He has helped you in the past. And he will still help you today. And the church says, Amen. Amen.